Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 9th of May, and actually some really cool new features this week, especially around storage. As always, if this is useful, uh, please subscribe, comment, like, and share, and hit that bell to get notified when I release new content or release a live session. New videos this week. So there's actually a bunch of little fun ones. Uh, I did a tour of my home gym, and the only reason I'm bringing this up here is some people have asked to see my dogs before, and they put in an appearance. Then I did kind of an overview, but it was nearly an hour long of Azure landing zones for both small, medium, large enterprises, really this prescriptive guidance and easy to deploy, getting started configuration for your environment. So I'll go through exactly what they are. Then I did kind of a deep dive on the Azure Instance Metadata Service. Now this is super specific, but it's basically all about, hey, from within a virtual machine in Azure, how it can find information out about the Azure Resource Manager resource it's actually running in. So I, I go through that detail. And then I also released a video of my routine. A bunch of people keep asking about how do you organize your day? So I finally gave in and created a video about it. So new features, a new VM SKU, so the NPV1 virtual machine has GA'd. Now in the past, all of these kind of N-series VMs have really been focused about bringing this GPU acceleration for visual uh, computational purposes. So the NPV1 is actually FPGA accelerated. So this is a circuit, remember, that can be programmed, configured, by the user. Now these are using this special uh, Alivio U2050 FPGA. So it's highly programmable accelerator. And it's really gonna be focused around very computationally intensive workloads like genomics, image processing, security, data analysis, and more. So there's a number of these available. Um, we have these different SKUs. If we go and actually look at this NP series, we can see, hey, we have the NP 10, 20, and 40 that really correspond to the number of virtual CPUs that we have and kind of the memory we have, temporary storage, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the number of FPGAs that are available and the amount of FPGA memory. So there's special um, APIs you're gonna to use to actually program those FPGAs from within, but then I actually get all the benefit of those capabilities. And then for AKS, we have this secret store CSI in preview. So this is a container storage interface. And really the big deal about this is now I can easily hook into Azure Key Vault. I can have workloads running in my pods that really don't have to understand all the different APIs of Azure Key Vault. What this will actually let me do is I can expose, for example, the secrets in my Key Vault like a part of the file system, like a slash mount, slash secrets, dash store, slash secret one, slash secret two, and they can just access that in a very standard way. Now the actual authentication to the Key Vault could be via a service principle, uh, user or system assigned managed identity, even pod identity. But it's gonna enable the workloads running in those pods to easily hook into Azure Key Vault. On the networking side, I talked about all of these before. So at Ignite, they talked about a number of new VPN gateway features. Well, these were in preview, now they're all GA. So a big one here was about multiple authentication types for the point to site VPN. This would now al allow me for the open VPN to have different types of client. I could have Linux, I could have Windows because now I can mix on the single gateway different tunnel types. I could have Azure AD, certificate based, radius, all on the same gateway. There's also better BGP diagnostics. I can see session statuses and routes advertised, routes learnt. I can get packet capture actually now from the portal. And there's just overall connection management reset at a per connection level. So those things have all gone GA. On the storage side, so Blob Operational Backup has GA'd. 
Now the key point here is it is operational backup. It is not taking the contents of my blob and copying it to a recovery services vault. The point of this operational backup is I could think about, hey, I have a whole number of, for example, different storage accounts. And there are certain features I can use on those storage accounts to help protect the data. For example, there's features like um, change feed. So it tracks the blocks change. There's blob versioning. There's kind of soft delete. So there's all these features that actually give me the, the ability when I combine those things together to go back to really any previous point in time. I can also do things like lock the storage account so it can't be deleted. So what this integration does is basically the Azure backup, I configure the values I want. How many days do I want to be able to go back to any previous point in time? And it's going to go and do that configuration on the storage accounts. It is not copying data to a vault. It's doing the configuration on them. So if we actually go and take a look, just so you can really kind of understand what this is doing. So if I jump over to my subscription, firstly, if I just go and look at my backup center, for example, now we can have different types of data source. Wait, it's going to be my data source over here. I can change that to Azure Blobs. And we can see I've got one protected. So I've already gone ahead and configured this. So on this particular storage account, I've gone and configured. You can see my protection is configured. And all we're really doing here, I could say, hey, change policy, is I've got it currently set to 14 days. So I'm going to retain the data for 14 days. What this actually does on the storage account, if we actually go and look at the storage account, well, if we go and scroll down and we look at its data protection, so we're over here on data protection, it's configuring those options I talked about for me. So it's turning on soft delete, it's turning on blob versioning, it's turning on the change feed. So it is going ahead and turning all of those things on. And I set it to 14 days, which is what we can see here for those go back to point in time. And so it adds five for the soft delete. So it is going ahead and configuring all those things for me. So from a central point of backup, I can automatically enable all of those things on my storage accounts. It does also, if we go and look, if I can remember where it is, my brain's not as good as it was, if we look at locks, you can actually see it put a lock on it as well. So it actually applied a lock to stop it actually being deleted, which again would otherwise result in me losing my data. So this is a nice capability that helps me centrally go and control now that ability to go back to previous point in times if there was a corruption, for example, on my data. Append blob is now supported in ADLS Gen 2. So remember, ADLS Gen 2 is the data lake. It's enabled by checking the hierarchical namespace when I create my storage account. That makes it an ADLS Gen 2, gives me that hierarchical file system, POSIX style ACLs. Well, now we support append blobs, the ability to have a blob. I just keep adding data to the end. So that is now GA. Prevent shared key on storage account is also now GA. Now, if we think again about the storage account, there's different ways I can actually interact with my storage accounts. When I go and do something at the data plane, so remember, we can kind of think about the control plane. That's things really at the Azure Resource Manager level. And then there's things at the data plane, actually uh, putting blobs, reading, etc. So there's a way, ideally, we use Azure AD. So we use Azure AD based um, credentials to then get roles to the data. But also on a storage account, we have kind of these access keys. So we have these access keys that are all powerful. Those access keys can also be used to sign shared access signatures. So what we can now do is we can say, hey, I don't want to use access keys anymore. Now, if you turn that off, 
That also means, well, I can't have shared access signatures that are signed by an access key. So it's basically going to say, hey, for accessing the storage account, I'm going to do everything through Azure AD. So if we jump over, it's just a configuration on that storage account. So I can kind of look at really this exact same storage account. If I go to configuration, it's a very small little option, but we can see here, hey, allow storage account key access. If I set that to disabled, I can now do anything that uses the access key. That includes shared access signatures. If you hover over it, it's going to warn you of that. And it's saying, hey, anything with shared key, including shared access signatures, will be denied. If you look at the documentation, there are some kind of metrics you can go and look at to check, hey, look, where am I using that access key to make sure I don't kind of break the world before you go and disable that. But that is now an option. And then finally, in preview, this new access-based access control is available on my storage account. And this is for Blob and ADLS Gen 2. And this is awesome. So ordinarily, as we just talked about, my access control is based on, hey, I, I have a credential and I give it a role at the data plane level. So this could be like data contributor, data owner, data reader for Blob. And I can do that at a container level. So within the storage account, there's different containers. But what if I want it more granular? What if maybe there's just too many roles? Now, if I think about it, the blobs I write, there are attributes about the blobs. There's actually like an index tag that can be configured. These are keys and values. And what we can now do with access, um, attribute-based access control, sorry, is I can now create conditions that in addition to the role, so there's a certain role, well, hey, there are also certain conditions that I specify that all go into, hey, if I can access that. So I can say, hey, yes, you get data reader, but only if the blob has project tag set to project X. Otherwise, I won't be able to read it. I can say I can only write a blob if I put an index key of this value. So I can put all these conditions now around my access. So super, super quick. I know I'm doing a lot of demos today. So on this same storage account, again, it's getting heavily used today. If I go to my access control, and let's say I go to my role assignments, remember there are roles that are associated to the data plane. Now I could create a custom role, but there are things like the storage blob data contributor, storage blob data reader, and those actually operate at the data plane. You can actually see I've got two here, storage blob data contributor, and I've got one of these is Justice League. I could do a view edit. I'll just create one from scratch. So I can say, hey, I want to add a role assignment and I'm doing the preview experience. So when I select that, so I'm going to pick a built-in role, but it has to be synced at the data plane. This attribute-based access call is not the control plane. It's things actually about the blobs and the, the data lake content. So I'm going to pick storage blob data contributor. So that's my role. Who am I giving it to? So I'll give it to a group. Um, obviously, we normally give things to the Justice League. I'll actually just say JL on this time. But notice now I have this condition. This is where I can optionally add conditions. Now, I can add conditions based on attributes of the resource, for example, those blob index tags, or, or and or, I can add it based on the request itself. So here for an action, I'm going to actually say, hey, read content from a blob with a tag condition. So as I have all these different options for the controls that I can add. So I'm going to say, hey, read content from a blob with tag condition. And then, so they're the actions, then I can add the expression. So I'm going to say, hey, is it is the resource? The attribute is going to be the value in the blob index tag. And what key do I care about? So I'm going to have a project key. And it has to equal, I don't care about the case, uh, project X, some super secret project. And save. 
So now it's created that condition. Hit next and I can go and assign it. So now for the people in the JL, that group, yes, they can go and read the blobs, but only if the project is set to X. And if you've ever looked at that, if you go and look, for example, at images, I'll look at one about my dog eating cereal, it's this blob index tags here at the bottom. It's not the metadata, it's not using that, it's blob index tags. You can see I added project X to that. So I would be able to view that blob. So that's really just an example of that feature. But I think it's super cool and super powerful that now we can have that additional granularity. So that, that was kind of a quick overview. I'll do a, a deeper dive of a deeper demo as a separate video. And then just one miscellaneous, and it's really the Azure Security Center April 2021 updates. So some of these are released, some of these are preview. So it's talking about a refreshed resource health page. So I'll actually just show this is probably easier. So if we go to Security Center, if I go to my inventory, and I look at a resource, so what it's really talking about now, what it's kind of updated, is, well, it's kind of showing me, hey, look, these are the actual recommendations highlighted here. I can see information about my environment. I can see, hey, I'm using Azure Defender for servers, and it's showing all these nice recommendations for me. So it's making it a lot more pleasant to actually go and see that detail. Then it's also got some enhancements to Defender for container registries, i.e. my images, but it's going to re-scan them weekly now. Enhancements for Defender for Kubernetes now supports Azure Arc. So my on-premises Arc managed CNCF compliant Kubernetes clusters, hey, it can protect those as well. Enhancements for the endpoint integration for Defender for 2019 and Windows 10 WVD. Enable Defender for DNS and Resource Manager. Those actually go and look at behaviors around at the ARM control plane and types of queries running against Azure DNS zones to look for signs of kind of bad things. New regulatory compliance uh, standards have been added. So again, if we actually go and look at our kind of regulatory compliance and you can see all the different ones we have available but essentially they've got some new ones. Actually, I'll just go to my overview over here. Policy, subscription. So these are ones I have. If I do add more standards, you can go and see those new ones that are available. So we have those. Then it talks about just some changes to the way they are presenting some of the recommendations, moving them around. If you actually go and look in Security Center, if you look at your overview, and then you actually you can see, hey, I've got my secure score, goes to my dashboard, I can drill down, I can see all these various recommendations. Well, we have this group by controls on the far right side, that's turned on. So what they're basically saying is some of the types of recommendation have been moved around like this implement best practices at the bottom is going to start getting more like the CMK um, type recommendations to use a customer managed key and just some other kind of depreciations and other types of recommendations moving things like that but a whole batch of things but overall all good stuff um, and that's it so that's this week's Azure update not a huge number of updates, but actually some really, really powerful ones. And I'm really loving those storage changes. That's it. Until next week, take care.